Good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's meeting of Corporate Scrutiny on the 20th of June 2023. Uh, we have some new members in the room tonight, so welcome Chris, welcome Lee, welcome Gareth. I uh, hope you settle in quick and uh, let's try and have a productive and good year. Uh, the first item on our agenda is apologies for absence. I note we've had apologies from Councillor Marie Bailey. Are there any other apologies to record? That's great, thank you. Uh, second item on our agenda is appointment of the Vice Chair of the Committee. Uh, I would personally take great pleasure in um, asking uh, Councillor Dan Maycock if he'd be willing to take up the position as Vice Chair and ask for a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Bain. Should we take a quick confirmatory vote or is there another nominee? All those in favour? You have to stay there, Dan, rather than switch everything around? <laughs> no worries. Uh, we have, as item three, two sets of minutes uh, carried over from last year that need approving. Uh, the minutes were from the meetings held on the 8th of February and the 14th of March, and they're here for approval. Could I possibly request a mover and a seconder? And I'm trying to spot who was on the committee last year. So, in which case, I'll be happy to move both minutes on block if I could have a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Price. All those in favour? I'll take those as carried. Item four on our agenda is there any declarations of interest for this evening's agenda? That's great, thank you very much. Uh, item five is update from the chairman. Uh, as this is our first meeting of the year, I don't think I'm going to have any quite yet, but I'm hoping that will improve in coming meetings. So I'll happily take us to item six, which is responses to reports of corporate scrutiny committee. On the 14th of March, corporate scrutiny sent a recommendation to cabinet to consider that Solway Trading, which is a company only owned by Tamworth Borough Council, uh, be wound up. Uh, basically, Cabinet agreed to place it in dormancy to release associated savings, but it wasn't to be wound up. So that, that is what that is. I don't know if there's any questions or comments on that matter. Okie dokie. I'll take us to item seven, uh, consideration of matters referred to corporate scrutiny from Council or Cabinet. Uh, obviously, start of the year, there won't be any yet. I'm hoping to see some through the year. Which takes us to item eight, uh, the quarter four performance report. This is the report of the leader of the council, as well as support from uh, the uh, deputy chief executive, Annie Goodwin. Uh, happy to hand over to the leader to introduce. Uh, just to note, Paul, um, obviously, this is the quarter four performance report before you were leader, so we'll try not to hold you too responsible. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, as a, as a newbie on the, on the block, uh, I think you've all read the 128 page or 129 page report that has been uh, succinctly put together by all our uh, executive team. Um, and it, you know, the, exec, the, the executive summary is pretty straightforward really. This is a final quarterly update on 22, 23, uh, and of the detailed performance against the council's new vision and corporate projects. Um, the corporate the performance report will be further developed over 23 24 uh, and in line with the uh, scrutiny and cabinet feedback so just to be really brief it is uh, you know a recommendation of the scrutiny committee that they endorse the contents of this report over to you chair uh, thank you very much anything to add Danny, from an officer perspective Okay, open the floor to questions and comments. Okay, I'm happy to start. Uh, if we flick to page two, which I believe is page 22 if you look at the paper copy. We've still never fixed that problem, have we? Obviously it says on here, uh, Marmion House. Uh, the last update was obviously in January 2023, when obviously we were aware we didn't get the uh, love funding. I just wonder if we had any further updates of where we are with Mam in the house. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Chair. I mean, at the moment, we are still um, looking to dispose of Mam in the house. There are um, discussions ongoing with, um, with our consultants in relation to the best means to actually undertake that. And obviously, some of the intense work that's been undertaken relates to the 
uh, masts that we have on the uh, roof of Marmion House, which has caused us uh, obviously some considerable issues in terms of that disposal programme. So we are in consultation with the uh, mast operators um, and close to um, resolving that particular issue. I would, I would say that we'd probably be in a position to bring back a more detailed update later in the year um, in relation to, uh, to, to that process for disposal. Thank you. On. It takes us to another question. Obviously, this is where the report kind of drops out of place. Um, if you're reading it on the laptop, it's page four, but it's also page four, but also page 22. <laughs> uh, obviously, we've got two items there in amber. Obviously, please have Paul with us this evening. Uh, garage site development, Caledonian regeneration, and asset management strategy are both currently shown in amber. If you go to the next page, obviously, there's a little bit more explanation. Uh, obviously, when the asset strategy came to corporate scrutiny last year, uh, there was a few requests from scrutiny, as is noted in the report, uh, to amend or add. I mean, certainly I was quite keen to see depreciation mentioned in any asset strategy. I just wonder if there's an update of where we got to, please, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a piece of work that's still ongoing at the moment. I think we've taken on board the comments that were made through scrutiny. Uh, and I believe there were also some comments came back from Cabinet as well uh, following that. So again, those are all being factored into it. I think we're sort of, it's probably fair to say it's close to final draft version based on that, ready to come back to either this committee or one of the other committees uh, for that, I suppose, a final read through before it goes forward to Cabinet for approval. Thank you very much. So obviously it's a little bit tied in within the report, so obviously the delay on the garage redevelopment of the Caledonian site, which I think is the old caravan park, if I remember rightly, on Caledonian. Obviously, is there a correlation in the delay because the asset strategy already wasn't ready, or is it just simply because the market wasn't interested in the site? Uh, again, Chair, no. On that one, unfortunately, it went through the planning process without any comments or uh, issues. When we actually got the contractor ready to go with it, uh, highways came back with an issue around some of the highway area on it that appears now to have been resolved and our contractors are working on actually the final version of it uh, and i believe we have a meeting at the end of this week to start the pre-contract so it's it's there or thereabouts it's just the fact that there has been some delay partly because we did struggle to get uh, to actually appoint through a contract uh, through tendering but also because of the planning issues that have come up uh, post post approval if you like Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Or am I just hogging the meeting at the moment? <laughs> Sorry, I'll continue then. Uh, page 10, obviously, within the organisation. Um, obviously, there's mention to the boundary review. Uh, do we have any further update on when we're expecting a boundary review and potentially an all-out election? I can come back to you and check that, though. Because the last figure I had yeah. was 2026. Yeah. But we've, they've been saying that for 15 years, haven't yeah. they? I think so. Um... Thank you. Just a couple more for me, I promise. Um, obviously, page 14 and page 35 makes reference to universal credit. And I've just been looking at the trends. And if you actually look at where we were two years ago with the universal credit claimants, the number's almost very similar to today, but private sector universal credit claimants seem to have gone down, while council tenants claimants seem to have gone up. I just wondered, is there any way we can understand what, exactly why that might be? Through you, Chair, I don't have any analysis on that. Um, I can have a, a conversation with the relevant officers and come back with a written response on that. I'm not yes, sure. Please. I'm not aware of any analysis that's been done on that. So um, you're quite right. That is a trend that's there. So uh, we'll have a look into that for you. Thank you. OK, um, I promise last one from me. Uh, obviously, on page 31, as you read it, uh, we, we've shown a reduction in claims for um, discretionary housing payments. But my, my question is basically this. In March 2022, we had 325 requests for um, DHP, but 207 were granted. That was 64% approved. Whereas in March 2023, we had 280 applicants, of which 120 were granted, which is only 43% approved. I was wondering if we understood why it dropped from 64% approval to 43. Was there any change in the process or the system? Or we, we know the government keeps changing the criteria. I just want to understand why there was such a, a drop in people approved for DHP. 
Chair, uh, apologies. I will have to go and confer with colleagues on that and provide a written response on that, that issue. I'm not aware of the, of the, the reasons for that drop, um, but I'll, I'll uh, confer and come back to you with a written response if that's okay. Thank you. Okay, that's all my questions. Any more questions from the committee? In which case, I'm happy to state, uh, having read many of these reports over the years, that actually there's nothing that absolutely screams out here that the organisation's got some serious problems. Obviously, there's a couple of comments in the HRA financial forecast about the longer-term 30-year HRA business plan, but that's always been an issue of making it work over a 30-year period. So I'm happy to move the recommendation that um, this committee endorse it and send it off to Cabinet. Hope for a second. Uh, Councillor Maycock, thank you. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. And can I thank um, the leader and the officers for their responses on their introduction? Thank you. At which point I'm happy to take us to item nine, housing repairs programme update, which I believe is the uh, report of the portfolio for planning and housing, Councillor Sam Smith. Probably take this one. I'll take this one, Chair, because uh, I think yeah, it's probably only right. Uh, yeah, so I was asked to just bring an update report on current performance of the housing repairs. Uh, so really, it's just a brief summary, I suppose, in terms of where we are with things, uh, highlighting some of the KPIs, identifying perhaps some of the areas where we need to improve the service. So as you'll be aware, uh, NG, who are now Equons, through sort of a name change, were appointed to carry out the repair service uh, in, sort of for, on a 10-year basis back in 2020. Uh, I think we'll all appreciate that first couple of years were a, a strange couple of years because they started literally just as everything was shutting down for COVID. Uh, hasn't really changed much in terms of the number of repairs that were reported and the performance uh, statistics, fortunately. Uh, but like I say, it was a bit of a strange time. Still averaging around about 17,000 uh, repairs a year coming through the call centre. Uh, that excludes any planned works, so that's only repairs. Uh, it equates to slightly more than three jobs per property per annum, uh, which is considered about the normal. Uh, within the contract, we have a suite of KPIs that we measure. And those are generally the same sort of KPIs that you'd report through sort of government statistics and the local returns. And as you can see from the report uh, from that, with the exception of the voids, uh, void turnaround time, they're all there or thereabouts. I think you know there's, there is some improvement certainly around the emergency repairs, uh, and I think sort of right first time is still an area where we're looking at. The one that clearly jumps out is the void return around time with a target of 8.6 days and an actual of 65 days. That is explained to some degree uh, below around turn. That target is based on what we consider to be a normal average cost void, and we have seen a large number of high cost voids uh, over the last couple of years. I did a very quick sort of uh, summary of the voids over the last couple of years, and those that were under three thousand pound in value, which I would consider to be still s sort of slightly higher than it should be, but probably a closer average we're turning around in 16 days. Still higher than we would expect, but clearly nowhere near the 65 days. Uh, there were a number of voids in there that were very high cost, either they were properties we'd acquired on the market and bought up to standard, uh, and some were structural type issues, but they're all lumped into that because when we report that figure, we always report the actual totals as opposed to uh, taking stuff out, which you know, technically we probably could take some of those off charge voids out. Uh, in addition to the sort of the KPIs, which are just purely statistical data extracted from our system, our call centre, who is now operated in-house, also do some callbacks to tenants following repairs. Uh, and that's, I suppose, more of a qualitative feedback process rather than just sort of quantitative. And again, as you can see from that, you know, First time fix is an area of concern for us. Uh, there could be various reasons for that. Some of it is around materials required. Uh, some could be around the report of the repair 
and the actual repair weren't quite as matched as they could be. Uh, so the wrong operative was sent out. But it's an area we know that needs some work on it and our customer services team work with, quite closely with Equans to try and sort of improve the, the, the call handling side, uh, the diagnosis of repair so that the right, you know, the right person will be allocated to do the repair. But also from Equans point of view, making sure they've got the right impressed van stocks for operatives and that their operatives are suitably skilled to do the work that are needed of them. So that's clearly an area that uh, needs improving. Uh, other than that, I think you know another area we know we get sort of feedback on is around appointments and uh, communications from the contractor. So again, it's an area we're working on. Complaints and disrepair. You know, it, it's fairly typical that our, we see high numbers of complaints in the repair service. It's been like that for as long as I can remember in repairs, and I've been doing it sort of 30, 30 plus years now, and it's always been an area of high complaints because people have high expectations. Uh, we're not always able to meet those expectations, either through service value or because, actually, they want more than we were ever going to provide as a service. Uh, I think, you know, look, looking at the complaints that we've had so far this year sort of in the 12 month period I think there were 22 complaints listed through our TELUS process of those I would say that 12 were actual service failures where we not not delivered the service we were supposed to and 10 were really sort of service requests complaints about things that were outside of our control or people not happy that you know things aren't within our repairs policy that they would like us to do for them so things like perhaps fencing uh, that's a tenant responsibility uh, we've told them it's their responsibility so there's not a complaint there that says we didn't know it's a case of they want us to do their work for them so it's you know so there's there's a variety of things in there <coughs> disrepair claims again they tend to come in fits and starts and it's usually when there's either a high profile case or where solicitors are in an area and although I suppose they're not really supposed to, are making their presence known and uh, promoting what their services. There's not, there's not really much we can do about that. that. That will always happen. We do take those any cases seriously. We don't sort of suspend any works or anything along those lines when we do get a legal challenge, although it's not uncommon for solicitors to tell their clients not to allow us to do work uh, to you know until their own surveyors have been into a property and surveyed uh, again slightly higher than it has been in the past but not you know not significant uh, which I was quite surprised at sort of certainly since the uh, damp and mold case that was very high profile uh, not too long back I did anticipate that there would be a lot more uh, cases of that nature come through and not really seen it uh, in response to that uh, case with the mould, we have sort of started reviewing the way we record uh, reported repairs for damp and mould. Previously, they were just reported through and on our system, and probably slightly harder to track. Now we actually have separate coding for damp and mould, which allows us to track those through our system uh, from the point of report to the point of completion. Uh, we've reissued our self-help guides to tenants to sort, so that they can help themselves around uh, dealing with damp. We have a process in place whereby we can refer people who are saying that they are struggling to heat the properties uh, from a financial point of view. Clearly what we can't do is pay for everyone's heating bill for them but we can try and support where we can with that uh, financial advice. And we've also sort of bought in some uh, monitoring equipment for those properties where there is a damp and mould issue. We can see there's a damp and mould issue, but it's not obvious what the causes are. So we've got some monitoring equipment that would perhaps allow us to, over time, to sort of get a picture for why that might be. Uh, in terms of sort of the current contract, we moved from scheduler rates to a price per property arrangement in April 23. The key purpose for that is to free up some resources on both sides to sort of focus more on the quality of service and quality of finished product as opposed to worrying uh, about the, the scheduling of codes and sort of the quantity surveying side. Uh, 
from a recent residence meeting uh, with the tenants consultative group I was told by a couple of tenants of that that operatives now when they turn up at properties are asking if they've got additional jobs that need doing that was the key aim of the, going over to that price per property is that the benefit for the contractor <coughs> is if they can do as much work in a property in one go it actually sort of saves them from having wasted journeys and wasted time sort of having to travel to and from jobs and having to attend the same property two or three times over a course of perhaps a few weeks to attend to each job if they can do them all in one go when they get to a property it's a cost benefit for them clearly that's also a benefit for the tenant because they just have one one person visit do all the jobs they need to do in that one visit and from our point of view it sort of solves it saves calls to our call center and it, it means we, we sort of, if we're doing post inspection of works, we only have to go out once to do multiple jobs rather than uh, lots of times to do individual jobs. I don't think at the moment that's fully embedded with all the operatives, uh, and I think it's fair to say that, you know, I think the contractor would agree with that. Uh, but we're working with the contractor to develop that. Not all operatives would be able to do that type of work. Uh, there are still some specialist works out there, things like roofing contractors, who will go out to do just roofing works, and they won't offer that service because it's not within their skill sets to do it. But where possible, we'll have the multi-skilled uh, operatives, and they can do as much of that work as possible uh, on, on site at any given time. Clearly, there will always be some works that are so specialist, you can't have a multi-skilled operative do it. You know, We wouldn't have someone who wasn't qualified to do electrical work or gas work, doing electrical work or gas work, because that's not, not safe, it's not appropriate. But for most of those sort of general generic repairs, uh, that's what they're doing. And again, like I say, we have regular meetings with the contractor at various levels. So there are operational meetings uh, with sort of the, the project officers and the team on the ground. The managers have meetings and then there's a core group meeting which is sort of a more I suppose strategic level meeting to discuss the higher level issues and go through the KPI reports and uh, the performance reports so really sort of from the port uh, from the point of view of the report that's all I got at this stage I mean obviously I'm happy to take questions on it thank you chair any questions or comments oh sorry Sam please Hello all. Um, so, just wanted to say, uh, everyone knows I'm new into this, um, but I have had a chance to look over the report. Um, a few highlights I wanted to talk about, uh, which I think are important. Um, just, um, <clears throat> just to bear in mind, this is obviously a scrutiny committee, so I think it's important that everyone does come out with their ideas and um, that's presented in this, uh, in this committee. I think it's really, really important. Um, so, as I said, a few highlights. So, there's obviously an aspect of the performance data, the surveys that are really coming into play here. So, I just wanted to mention that that's an angle that we can we can certainly concentrate on and look at the uh, the core information, the core commentary from that. That's important. The um, the move from the schedule of rates to price per property, as uh, Paul alluded to, I think that's quite interesting. It, it seems to be more uh, of an efficient way of doing it in terms of being able to go into the property and, uh, you know, if there are other issues that are uh, presenting themselves that can be dealt with at the same time. So I'm taking that one as a, as a, as a quite a big bonus. Um, and um, also I was going to say the the repairs contact contact center the, the customer services aspect of it coming into house um, <clears throat> so I'm planning to uh, to visit uh, the team there I think it's going to be uh, an interesting uh, a visit so if anyone wants to come along let me know drop me an email I think that could be quite uh, productive and educational to see it from that perspective um, so that's what I gotta say on that and then the damp and mold issue is, is is one that's very prominent. It's very prominent in the media. Um, Paul, Paul's talked about uh, the equipment that's been taken on on as well, and uh, be, to be able to monitor that as well. So there's aspects of that we can go further as well. So just wanted to highlight um, those uh, those issues, and uh, welcome anybody's comments on that. But uh, hand back to Danny. Thank you very much, Councillor Dial. 
Thank you. Um, looking at the report, you've already acknowledged that you're uh, on page 130 with a 69% right first time. Um, that's 835 people that we don't get it right with first time. How many of them are families with kids where they've had uh, issues with essential eating or something? It's, what this report seems to lack is uh, a program underneath it to address the issues that you've raised. The, there's, you mentioned that uh, you don't quite hit the figures. Uh, I mean, emergency calls, 24 hours uh, or over is like down 6%. There's a couple of targets that you miss, but there's no mention of recovery plans and what you're going to put in place to resolve that. That would have been helpful. Um, I, if this report comes back uh, here, I would hope that it includes something that addresses that figure of 835 people or families. <coughs> Thank you. Good follow up, Paul. Yeah, no, ta fully take on board your comments on that one. As I said, I think so, when I was talking through it, we are working with the contractor on looking at improvement plan and addressing those. In terms of the right first time, that's the tenant's perception and what they are sort of saying, we don't think you did it right first time. There will always be some jobs where we can't actually finish in one visit. So that doesn't, that, that's, that sort of report there is the, uh, the tenant's perception and feedback report as opposed to any sort of commentary back from the contractor. So if, if they have to replace a door, for example, then they were never ever going to be able to go out and replace that door on the first visit because it's got to be measured, it's got to be ordered, uh, it's got to be delivered, they've got to fit it. So, you know, sort of say for a front door, for example. So that was never ever going to be done first, right first time because it, it's not possible to finish it on one go. But when you ask the tenant the question, did they, do it, did they come out and do the job in one hit? The answer is no, and that's a fair comment. It's a no, but there's some there'll be some narrative behind some of those. Not all of them. I know, you know, totally accept that there will be some, quite clearly, where they've gone out and they haven't done the job in one visit. That will always, you know, that that will happen. There will always be those sorts of service failures. But of those 800, the piece of work that needs to happen is to analyse those and sort of say, okay, so which of those were realistically should have been done in one visit, and which of those realistically were never going to be done in one visit but I, I suppose where I'm coming from is when you ask the tenants the question they have honestly answered it no they didn't do it in one visit and that's fine but were they ever going to do it in one visit is the, is the answer we need uh, because I think there is a difference there in terms of expectation and you know real, realism if you like Okay, so which is wrong, the customers or the metrics you're recording? As I said, that's, that question is asked of the tenants. That, that's their perception question. That's not the performance statistic question, and they are different. If we look at our performance statistic questions, those are just raw data that says those were the targets and those were the actuals, so what, what did they hit? The, the perception questions are asking a tenant, did they do? Did they come out and do it in that first visit? So the tenant isn't wrong in sort of the answer they've given, but I think what we what we need to understand is what we're not saying to them is, oh well, they're never going to do it in one, one visit. When we ask that question, so it's just a straight question: Did they do it in one visit? And the answer is no, they didn't. From our side, we need to sort of look at that and say, well, was it expected to have been done in one visit? And it's, it's the way you ask the questions of it because they are perception questions as opposed to just hard data. Councillor Claymore. Thank you, Chair. I, I think that resident perception is a really important issue, to be fair. Um, when you were talking about the first time fix, although Steve's stole my thunder a little bit on that one. Um, you did say Councillor Claymore, sorry, can you pull your mic a bit closer? <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Um, you did mention that um, sometimes it's not necessarily the repair that they're reporting. It's not necessarily the same thing as what needs doing. So could we, at some point during like the course, the call centre taking, 
actually ask more questions about what it is is required because they're talking to a resident, not a building expert, not an electrician, not a gas person. They're just explaining to you in simple terms what is wrong with the what what the repair is required. So in my view, resident perception is paramount. It, we need to ask more questions of the residents. Oh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, absolutely agree with you on that one. I mean, I think, you know, it's fair to say that the call centre have developed over time. You know, it was a new service that was bought in-house. They have developed their questioning techniques and they have developed their diagnosis techniques. But I think we also have to accept the fact that sometimes people just don't actually know what the problem is. They just say, I've got water coming from my ceiling. Now, that could be a roof leak or it could be a burst pipe. There's only so many questions you can ask a person to get to a point where they don't actually have an answer for you beyond, well, I don't know, it's water coming through my ceiling. And I think that's the one where you could send out a roofer thinking, oh, it's been raining, they've got water coming through the ceiling. The roofer gets there and it's a leak from under, you know, from a, a tank or something in the roof space. So conversely, you might send a plumber out thinking, oh, it's probably a leak from a, a tank and it turns out to be a roof leak. The, the re, you know, yes, you can ask as many questions as you want, but there, also, there, there does come a point where actually the tenant perhaps just doesn't know an, enough to be able to answer the questions that, you know, to get you to a proper diagnosis. And again, there's lots of toolkits you can use for it, but all of them come to a point at some point in there where you've asked everything you can ask and you still don't get a true diagnosis because actually, as you say, they're not experts and all they know is what the symptom is but not necessarily what the, what the cause is or where it's coming from. And I think, you know, it, you can only challenge so much before you get to a point where you say, well, actually, we just need to send someone out to actually, you know, to, to have eyes on <coughs> diagnosis. Well, of course, at that point, potentially you've already failed your first time fix because if that person goes out and it happens to be the wrong trade who isn't skilled to do that job, then straight away you've failed that first time fix because the wrong person's gone out because you diagnosed the repair the best you could, given the information you were at hand. And I think, again, repairs will always have that nature of the unknown in there, because that's just the, that's just the way it is. And you're dealing with people who don't necessarily understand what the problem they've got is. They just know what the symptom is, and they can see what's happening, but they don't know why. Councillor. Oh, please, plans to play more, yes. So the position is, I'm a tenant, I ring up, there's water coming from my ceiling. What do I get asked? And am I told somebody's coming out to fix it or somebody's coming out to have a look at it, potentially to fix it? I, th I think through you, Chair, if you, if you made that call and said, I've got water flowing through my ceiling, that would um, almost certainly fall into an urgent repair. So you would get somebody out there within that sort of priority emergency um, time period who would make safe who would basically deal with the immediate issue so you wouldn't be left with water coming through your your ceiling um, and, and then if necessary an appointment or a, you know the relevant um, uh, additional trays would be put into motion you would get get an appointment and be told when that repair would be done clearly if you're left without water then you know th that would be um, again would come into a kind of urgent repair so I, I think just to pick up a few issues obviously perception is important and when you know I don't think anybody here is saying that the customer's perception of what has happened is not important I think the point that we're making is that you know, there, there will always be a time when multiple trades will have to visit on for multiple occasions to complete repairs. That will always be the case. Um, the, 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 the indicator that we have that we uh, work with our contractor on is that they achieve 85% basically first time fix and their performance is 83.47%. Uh, 80, so they're coming close to that target. And, you know, at the point where they exceed or meet that target, then again, that opens up a conversation with them about other areas where we can improve. Um, clearly, there is a, a mismatch necessarily between that performance data and what our customers' perceptions are. And again, that's something we would be wanting to sort of dig into, because what we also want to see is an increase in, in, um, in satisfaction. But I don't think it would be... Um, 
fair to sort of say that that, that um, comes back to leaving 800 odd households without gas, water, etc. Because clearly those would be um, priority repairs that will be dealt with, if you like, in a in a different way. There are some repairs which will have to be done on with with multiple visits. Obviously, what we want to do is reduce that over time, improve that area of performance, as do every social landlord. Um, and the tools that we sort of use to do that, as you as you've identified, Councillor Claymore, some of that is about interrogation of the first time, you know, the first point of contact. What information can we glean? What information can we get that would be useful for the contractor to, to actually make that, that visit? Um, and also then, you know, other issues around sort of multi-trade operatives, um, ensuring that the contractor has the right um, tools and, and uh, stuff on the van. And that's again, is always a point of conversation with contractors. So, that, so I think, just to sort of wrap that up, that, that clearly we're not saying the tenants, anybody's wrong here or the tenant's perception is wrong. I guess what we're saying is there will always be a need for multiple visits. That should not be um, it, you know, where there is an urgent need to, um, to, to complete a repair. Um, but you know, we, we are obviously working with the contractor to improve that perception as much as we are to improve the, um, the, the sort of the, the key data, the KPI. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Maycock. Chair, Chair. Uh, thank you for just uh, clearing that up um, because I was a bit confused earlier whether it was um, customer satisfaction that, that was being used for the KPIs, but, but now it, it, it's completely separate. The KPIs of contractors' satisfactions just through the call centre. Is, is that correct, yeah? The, uh, yeah, the satisfaction is achieved, um, that data is achieved basically by the call centre actually contacting people and doing a qualitative interview. The, the information for the KPI comes out of the shared kind of repairs system, so that is kind of, that is digital data. Um, when was the repair reported and when was it completed? Thank you. Just a couple more. Um, <clears throat> you said about complaints this year being 22 that have gone in. Is that since January or is that over the last 12 months? I've looked at it. I think that's the last 12 months based on what I was told, but I need to look <laughs> at that one because, like I say, I, I think the tell us stuff that we get through is is only what comes through the TELUS system. It's not sort of any other people where people may sort of phone in and sort of say, well, I'm not happy about uh, something. So that's the recorded complaints through TELUS. So, it, it, you know, yeah, there'll always be some that come through different routes, but that's what's come through the TELUS. And, and I think councillor uh, inquiries come through TELUS as well, but I wouldn't swear to that one because I don't, you know, it's only the report I was given on that. I'd say that that's not a represented figure of p p people that have been getting in contact with us, that, that just councillors have had to get in contact with officers. So that figure to me over the last 12 months is not right. I, I can only tell you what I was given by the team who managed the TELUS process uh, because they actually record and capture all the complaints for reporting on it. Sorry, can I just follow up on that? So you actually don't take one of my questions and I've just done a bit of calculations. So obviously, if you just pick a target out of the air, say 90% on one of them, okay? 17,000 repairs a year, give or take. That would mean we expect to get 1,700 repairs wrong for the sake of argument. Just for the sake of argument, I know it's a bit more complicated than that. If we break that across the 10 wards in Tamworth, that's 170 repairs per ward that have gone wrong. That's almost a phone call every two days for a councillor. But actually, let's reanalyze that. I'm in Trinity. I'm aware I've only got 16 council houses. So if you're a councillor in Belgrave, Stony Delph, or Hamilton, you're potentially risking a call every day. That is what you're risking. Now, councillors should work hard. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm basically getting to is, I'm going to digress slightly here to get to Councillor Maycock's point. As many of you were aware, I've got a young baby. And last year, my wife took the baby to a show at the assembly rooms that was full of puppets and men dressed as dragons, etc., etc. It sounded like hell to me, so I didn't go. But she went as part of the NCT group we were a member of, so it was six mums with six babies. So while they were at the assembly rooms, they thought, afterwards, we'll stay here and have something to eat. Guess what the assembly rooms had, didn't have while they had a baby show on? High chairs. So all these other mums complained to Michelle, because she was a councillor at the time, and said, come on, that's got to change. So Michelle contacted an officer who said, unless these mums put it on the TELUS scheme, there's nothing we can do. 
Those other mums then said to my ex, the ex councillor, Miss Cook, I've told my councillor, as far as I'm aware, I have complained. I would question that 22 picks up the stuff sent in from councillors. Unless somebody fills in a tell us, it isn't picked up. That has got to change today. We need that data to be correct. When a councillor is contacted, it means something's gone wrong. Very rare is a councillor, as a resident, ring you up and tell you that the repair was brilliant. They ring you when they want to say something has gone wrong. Something isn't happening as I was promised or I thought I was promised, whatever the reason. That, to me, is, a, is an avenue for a complaint into the council. Let's remember when we truly think about it, the council, by definition, is 30 councillors. We are the council. When people complain to us, it is a complaint to the council. We need to fix that data today. Complaints that come in to councillors need to be picked up and recorded because to say there's been 22 complaints on this service, when we look at 93%, 92%, 83%, 80%, is, as Councillor Mayor Corley says, it just doesn't make logical sense and no business would behave that way. We're missing an entire set of data, an entire opportunity to capture and fix opportunities. So certainly I'd like to move a recommendation immediately to the committee that we send a recommend, recommendation to cabinet that we immediately change that and all avenues of complaints are picked up in that data. And I'd look for a seconder for that motion. I'll take Councillor Maycock. All those in favour? So can we capture that and send to cabinet? It's not my last one, don't worry. Oh, I'm sure it's not. So can I just say um, that all avenues of complaints are, are picked up in the, in the tellers data? Well, what, the what tellers is one element. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so that, that was my point. I think it's the point you were trying to get to, Councillor Maycock, wasn't it? It was, Chair, but I've got, I've got a little bit, little bit more on top of that as well. So, it said you've been told that 22 complaints have gone in through the Telos and 12 of them were confirmed as complaints. I was helping a resident uh, earlier on this year and I said, you've been dealing with this problem for two years you need to put a complaint in. She did. Next time I contacted her, she got told by the council that it had been taken off as a complaint because it wasn't a real complaint. Well, I'm sorry, but if somebody's been dealing with a problem for two years and then has to sleep on the floor for six weeks, that's a complaint. If there, if there ever is one. Sorry, Chair, if I might. I mean, if you give us the specific, I mean, I think I know the case you're talking about, but certainly that should never happen. And if, if a customer um, indicates a desire to complain, then, you know, it's, it's not down to us to decide whether that's a complaint or not. I think um, what Paul's alluding to there is, is um, analysis of that complaint once it has been gone through that system. Um, but certainly there should never be an occasion where we, we deny somebody's right to complain. But if you, if you can... You know, I think I know the case, but if you confirm that, then we'll have a look at that. Thank you. Sam, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, just jump in on that one. Um, are we saying, just to confirm on the recommendation here, are we saying that the quality of data that's coming through the customer service team, any kind of negative comment on that, are we saying that's feeding into the complaint system? I think what the, I think. This, what the risk report is reflecting is only the, those that have gone through the TELUS system. I think that a problem which has been in, um, in existence for, for a, not a short while has been about how we capture all information and, and customer feedback. What I am aware of is that Zoe Waliki um, has um, some, some work underway at the moment which is to bring together all of the feedback um, that we get from members via a single email address, um, which will enable us then to use that as our primary source of data uh, on these types of issues so that we'll be able to have a more uh, holistic and fuller view about, um, about you know, what feedback we're receiving. Um, so I think the recommendation from scrutiny is, is timely because I think we have some, some measures in place which will help to, to address that. Um, but I think it's, it's, you know, the 22 that are referred to in here is, the, uh, is, is just what comes through that TELUS process, which, of course, we would have to acknowledge is not going to be everything. It isn't always caught through that TELUS process. So that, but as I say, that's something that, that Annie's team has been working on um, to try and improve on that situation. Thank you, Chair. I've had Councillor Price patiently waiting. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I've got a couple of couple of questions. Um, I just wanted to quickly touch on Equins or NG as they used to be known. Um, it says the contract um, lays for ten years. Um, could you just tell me how long have we got left on that ten years? The contract commenced in twenty twenty, so it runs through till twenty thirty. So the contract's been going for about three years, and I've just been looking at the, the KPIs. I, I like KPIs. I like trend data. What I'm struggling with is there's, there's nothing in the KPIs that tells me, are we better than last year? Are we worse than last year? Um, the trends look like they're trending down from the point of view of Equins, but trending upwards from the point of view of the, the in-house customer service, which is great news. But the concerning bit is Equins, they're, they're, they've been with us before under their old name and they appear to be getting worse based on the trend data that I've got here. The report, whilst I thank you for the report, I'm struggling to be able to scrutinise properly the, 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 the report because there's not enough data here for me to be able to look at and to scrutinise. Um, I'd like to recommend, Chair, that this report goes away and comes back to us with more detail um, and the detail that we require to properly be able to scrutinise this um, because at the minute I'm really struggling to be able to do that and I'd look for a seconder for that. Thank you Councillor Price, you're actually beating me to it. Um, I was going to use an example shortly of why I feel this data is difficult to read in its current format but I've had uh, Councillor Bain patiently waiting so I'll fetch in Councillor Bain first and we'll return to that point and we will take a vote on it. Right, uh, thank you for the report. That's an interesting report. Um, I'd like to support the, the point that's just been made. In addition to the lack of real trend analysis, there's also a lack of benchmarking against equivalent authorities. So I'm not sure if what I'm looking at is good or bad, because I don't know what everybody else is doing. Um, I also wanted to pick up on the use of the complaints process. I deal with complaints processes in a number of areas uh, where I work. And there is an anxiety amongst a number of people about using complaints process. Um, and they would rather do an informal process through a, through a councillor. But even then, that on its own creates anxieties as well. So the use of complaints is, is um, a very ineffective way of measuring whether a service is succeeding or not. The only thing it's good at showing is whether you have an accessible complaints process or not. It doesn't tell you anything apart from that. Um, and I also have to say that the, the compliance with the KPIs that I'm seeing here um, does not equate to what I'm hearing on when I go out and talk to residents. This is not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing about very long waits. I'm hearing about very poor communications. I'm hearing about damp problems that have been going on for years. And I, I, really, do, um, I do, really do feel that we, it does need to come back with a lot more information. And, and while I'm on the subject, because I'm in full flow now, as you can see, Chair, um, on voids, um, I think we need a lot more information on voids um, because they are expensive both in financial terms and in social terms. They are expensive. And, and we have had some initial analysis about saying the reason for the delay is that some of the voids are so expensive. But actually what I need to understand is why they're so expensive. Does that mean the housing stock is poor? Does that mean the stock survey hasn't been done properly? What does it actually mean for us? And what are the financial implications of having a void um, which, which is turned around in 65 days instead of 8.6? I mean, what is the implication of that for this authority? So I've got a range of things, Chair, and I do think the idea of coming back with something that gives us a little more information on what is the most common complaint that I receive as a councillor, I think would be extremely helpful going forward. Yeah, thank you. Just before I fetch in Councillor Doyle, because it's apt that I, I, was, I was about to raise a similar point about the voids. I mean, the first thing that stands out for me is target of 8.6 days, actual 65 days. But that's an average, which means a lot of them are a lot more. It's not 65 days is when it's happening. It means some of them could be 100 days, 120 days, which starts to get concerning. So quick sums off the top of my head, and feel free to shout at me, Rob or Paul, if I get any of this wrong. If you said 
Said we're turning them around in 65 days, as you say. If we said we had 50 voids a year, pulling it out of the air, I make that 3,200 and something. Uh, divided by seven to get it into weeks. What's our current rent? 88 pound a week, give or take. Sounds about right. Yeah. I reckon that 45 to 50 grand a year we write off in voids. And that's just me doing sums off the top of my head before we even get into some of these problems. Now, I absolutely agree in the motion that's been moved, and we'll get to the vote after Councillor Doyle's question, is my problem with that is, Average 65 days, exactly. Below, there's a comment about some of them are complicated and more expensive. Okay. The data I'd like to see is the ones that can fall into a category of fundamentally complicated, and can we store that KPI over here? And actually, let's see in the real stuff where we're turning around because it's a dirty carpet or we've got to remove some wallpaper. What is the real void turnaround versus the major problem? And if we break that somehow into two, we get a real picture then of how are we actually performing against voids rather than just, like you say, write a line there that says some are complicated because, like you say about the data, it's not telling us anything, is it? Appreciate what we've been shown, but I absolutely agree. And I think we've all seen a request from Councillor Richard Kingston on email who really wants to delve into this as well. So I'm, I'm happy. Uh, does anybody want to Sorry, Steve, did you want to come in quickly? Yeah, you've kind of pinched my question. <laughs> well, my point, the pair of you. So. <laughs> but, uh, what I was going to say is in terms of the voids, it's what you call it, uh, that metric is useless. If I was doing SPC, that the data there is skewed because you've included all the special occurrences, so it, the data is absolutely worthless. So... And as Danny has uh, led to, it's what you call it, they need to be broken down where you've got voids that are either 8.6 days or less, and then those that go over it. I mean, to be honest, you could probably have a third level there where it's extreme. So, um, but that was the point I was going to raise, but uh, you've both kind of jumped on it. <laughs> yeah, please, Paul, yeah. Yeah, in terms of that, absolutely, I can break down those figures for you on the voids. You can have that data, it's all there. In terms of reporting as a KPI, we report it because that's a standard metric that we report through to uh, sort of our annual return data. So we have to report that because it's a true figure. You know, yes, there are some in there. In terms of the, the way the metrics set out for our government returns, they ask us what the average turnaround on voids based on number of voids and number of days to complete. So that's where that figure's come from. So that's a figure we report, and it's a figure that's benchmarked against. Whether we agree in terms of the who set, who set that KPI that it should be right or not, it's a government statistic that we report on. Internally, yes, we can sort of give you breakdowns into, you know, any value you want but in terms of the overall kpi it's there because that's the one that's the metric that's reported nationally uh so we would still report on that because that's the national uh, national metric uh well what i'd say there is if you're going to report that out and that figure is nonsense to be honest it's what it should do where you've got the star rather than reporting uh commenting that some of the uh voids are slightly worse than we expected or whatever there should be data to support that figure and how you've arrived at it not just a bland statement thank you can still take on board the comment on that one internally yes we can do that and i think you know this report was effectively done for this committee just to sort of give you that brief overview so in terms of more detailed data happy to work with chair on uh, sort of what that data needs to look like in terms of the level of data you want it's all there because it's, it's system generated as i said really that kpi exists because we report on that as a, a government statistic that we send through on our annual returns so we measure against it because we have to measure against it uh, but in terms of what sits behind it, as I said, I think, you know, I did a very sort of rough calculation, sort of, uh, and it was only a filtering on an Excel spreadsheet of every void under 3,000 was about 16 days. Still not where it should be, but clearly a different picture to the 65 days, and the 3,000 is probably a more realistic void cost. Uh, but yeah, we can break it down into whatever value we want to break it down into. It's, it, you know, it, there's lots of data there that says that's how much the void cost and that's how many days it took to complete and we can break that down quite easily so it's really just sort of working with the with the committee to sort of say what level of data do we want out of it councillor maycock uh, just a little bit more on, on on the voids that you were saying that 
that, that we purchase some properties and that the ones that are taking so long are because we're going to have to renovate them, get them up to standard. Why are we buying them when it's taking so long to do them up? I think it's more when a tenant leaves and before we can put another tenant in, we have to repair the property. No, but earlier you said that, that you, you per, you've been purchasing as well, haven't you? There's a mixture of both. Where we, where we buy a property, before we make an offer on it, we actually do a financial assessment to see whether the cost of the property plus works that are required on it still meet our 50-year payback period. If it doesn't, we wouldn't purchase. But many of them, because the works that are needed on it are reflected in the purchase price it still works out for us that it's it's a cost advantage to do it particularly where they're larger properties or properties that we're in need of within our stock so for example four bed properties at the moment are in high demand we don't have many of them so if one came on the market that was at the right price but needed work doing to it but still fell within our cost envelope for financial viability we might still buy it because it's there's a demand for it and it meets the financial modeling for us so it still has to fit within the financial model, even if it, even if spending large sums of money on it. But you're saying it could still be financially viable over 50 years, but it could be void for six months while you're getting it sorted? Potentially, yeah. Uh, but again, as long as it stacks up financially, that's our model that we use for uh, acquisitions. Councillor Price, did you want to jump in? Uh, just a quick comment, Chair. Just on the um, uh, the, the report coming back and, and from a data analyst point of view, um, I, I would prefer the more data you can give me, the better. Um, I, I'd like to be inundated with data to the point where I'm saying, saying to you there's too much. Um, I, I'm not sure we can have too much, but, you know, if we can get to that point... Um, because I think I, I agree with every, every everybody's comments tonight that you know this is this is something that we do really need to look into and take seriously, um, and I just don't feel that we that we can at the moment. Um, I, but but I do feel that it's a it's a really important issue. Um, so yeah, the the more data that we can get next time, the the better from my point of view. Okay, I think we're all singing from the same hymn sheet now. I've got Chris patiently waiting, but before I fetch Chris in, I think we don't need to take a vote. I think we're all literally saying on the next uh, meeting, we, we want to see more. And obviously, if you empower me in speaking with you guys to contact Rob and Paul and get together the data we do want, we can properly drill into this issue more. We might not even do it over one meeting. It's such a big issue, as Councillor Bain rightly says. This may take a few months. But yeah, let's fetch back some proper data. I don't think we need a vote. I'll get that onto the agenda, make sure we get some, the right uh, information in front of us next time. As Paul, to defend Paul, as he rightly said, uh, he was asked to just fetch some basic data just to be quickly looked at, and it was an overhanging issue from last year's corporate scrutiny. So, absolutely, I think now the officers know what we're asking for, that can be easily prepared. So, did you want to make your point, Councillor Bain? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to talk about damp and mould for a second, because I was um, with a, a, a resident last week who's been struggling with damp and mould problems for about five years and the local authority has given that family a number of different reasons for that damp and mould being there, ranging from the fact she doesn't open her windows enough through to potential structural problems. So I was thinking about the monitoring equipment that you referred to earlier and how people actually get access to that and what criteria are used before you actually use that so that people like her don't keep struggling. And she's another one who won't use the complaints process because she's worried about what it might mean. Yeah, I mean, essentially, it's not really for tenants to request the monitoring equipment. It's more for where we have a report of damp and mould and can't diagnose an obvious for, uh, cause for it. Uh, where, where something's obvious, clearly we should, we should be expecting our uh, damp and mould specialists because we, our own staff have had some general training around damp and mould uh, and they, they all attended uh, a course on that. We also have uh, access to dampened mould companies, so you know, to do specialist surveys. The monitor equipment was more intended for those properties where we have views on what be, might be causing it, but it doesn't correlate with what we're being told and what we're seeing on in the property. So it's really to sort of think, it looks at things like relative humidity, uh, temperature uh, and those sorts of things within a property 
because it's, it's quite common for people to say, oh yeah, my windows are always open and I always have my heating on, but actually that monitoring equipment might say, well, but the temperature never rises above such and such and your relative humidity is always at this level. So it doesn't necessarily correlate with what we've been told and then it's trying to find out why those two things don't work. And it could be, you know, people are only heating one room at a time as they move around a house. Not uncommon at the moment. Uh, you know, they may open a window for a short period while they're doing some work or, you know, bathing and then close it and not using the extractor fan. So it's, it's, it's that type of monitoring equipment more than anything. So it's to diagnose those where there's an anomaly that we can't really understand uh, just from visual inspections or survey work. Yeah, I mean, it, it, um, it's beginning to sound as though it's, it's the tenant's responsibility to sort this out, and actually it isn't, because they don't have the understanding about how to do that. And she has done, uh, she assures me, and having met her, I believe her, she has done everything she's been asked to do. They've been struggling for five years. They've got a child who has a continuous lung condition now which they are concerned about whether it's, it's the mold and, and that that's doing it. And they've got a, a mother with a heart condition who's in her 80s and is looking extremely frail, who can't get out and do all this stuff. And now I went round that house. I saw it for myself. And this was on a warm day, a warm, dry day, and I saw it for myself. It's there. So I don't understand what this woman has to do to get the support she needs. Can somebody help me? I mean, to be honest with you on that one, I, I can't answer you on a specific case without knowing any of the details. So I think if you just drop me a line uh, on the email, I'll have a chat with the repairs team and find out what they know about that particular case uh, and we'll come back to you on it. Yes, yeah, Sam. Yeah, I was just going to say, if anybody's got any um, residents in uh, any of the properties of these concerns or similar concerns, please do um, let the relevant people know straight away. Any further questions or comments on this item? Or should we accept we're going to fetch it back to the next meeting and get into it a bit deeper? Councillor Price. Not a question or comment on this, uh, Chair, but um, I, I will welcome you bringing it back to the next meeting. But um, with your permission, may I be excused? Thank you. Okay, uh, I believe we've got one recommendation to Cabinet and also that this be uh, brought to the next committee and through the committee I'll work with the officers to make sure the data comes that we need to have a good look into. Thank you very much for that. Which point I'll take us to item 10, leaseholder service charges. Uh, obviously welcome again the portfolio leader for housing and planning, Councillor Samuel Smith and the Assistant Director Paul Weston. Take this one again, thank you. Uh, yeah, so again, this is really, I suppose, a carryover from previous meetings where we've talked about leasehold service charges. Uh, pr primarily, it's come about as a result of some consultation notices that went out a while ago now uh, for a number of flatted properties where leaseholders effectively via sort of via members largely challenged uh, the charges that were sent out to them. Worth noting, we haven't actually issued any invoices to leaseholders because we haven't actually done any works in those properties yet. Uh, it was purely the stage three consultation that we have to do as part of the uh, Common Holder Leasehold Reform Act, uh, whereby we have to go through various stages of notification and uh, consultation with uh, leaseholders before we can do work in their properties. Uh, the works themselves were, were planned to be done under our existing contract through Waits, who do our planned works for us. That contract was procured at the time we were still in the EU, so it was an EU uh, procurement process. It also has to comply with the public contract regulations, PCR 2015, uh, which set out the requirements for public procurement exercises. It's a three-stage consultation process. Stages one and two take place prior to the awarding of a contract. So that's basically saying we intend to let a contract, this is the basis of the letting the contract and why we need to let a contract. Uh, and there are opportunities for leaseholders to feed back on that process at that stage. Stage three is done prior to works being done on site. And that again is a consultation process that says, this is what we're planning to do. It gives an outline of the intended costs. At that stage, it's not about 
the contract itself, it's about whether or not leaseholders believe those works to be necessary or required. Uh, so I think there's an important distinction there that I think some of the leaseholders were querying why they weren't able to choose their own contractor for that work. And you know, it's important to recognise that the time to put forward nominations for contractors were stages one and two of the consultation process. Stage three of that consultation process is purely around are those works needed on the property? And you know, there is an opportunity for people to comment on that one. Uh, those stage three notices were issued to the leaseholders. There's an opportunity for formal representations to be made and that has to be done within 30 days of those notices going out and it has to be in writing. Uh, that's set out in, in the Leasehold and Common Old Reform Act. Uh, it needs to be in writing because it has to be recorded and if it goes to any sort of uh, tribunal, then those representations uh, form part of that case at a tribunal. We don't have to take on board those representations if we don't want to. Uh, we can choose to ignore them. However, if you do ignore them and it does go to a tribunal, clearly you ignore them at your own peril. Uh, because it's likely to, sort of, or it has the potential to go against you at a tribunal if those representations were later, later found to be reasonable. Uh, clearly, if the representations were unreasonable, then that, you, you can argue and sort of say, well, you know, yeah, we, we take on board your comment or we note your comment. However, we didn't consider that to be a reasonable representation. Ability to afford the works is not a valid representation whilst I accept that you know it's a valid concern from a from the point of view of the common hold and leasehold reform it's not a valid representation the representations for stage threes are those works necessary and appropriate uh, as opposed to I can't afford to pay for them I think some of the issues raised through the uh, previous scrutiny committee wording of the notices I think we've agreed that yes we'll try so far as possible to put as much information in those notices as possible but they still have to be legally compliant and there is a legal process that you have to go through and some legal wording that you need to go through uh, for it to be legally compliant chair did, did you want to jump in with questions that beforehand because i was just see no, no you sure finish your introduction. yeah that's fine then uh there was an, an element around the cost estimates again I think it's important to recognise at this stage what we've provided is a cost estimate based on what we've had on previous works. Because this contract is tendered through a schedule of rates through, uh, through that procurement process, we actually only charge for the works that are done on that property. And that's measured as part of the completion of the job so we know what's being done at the property. So at the moment, no... Ch no no, no invoices have been made. They are not formal quotations. They are a cost estimate to give people an indication as to what be, we, we believe the cost would be. Uh, certainly, there are some concerns being raised about sort of you know could a, could a, uh, you know the local roofer do it for less money? Yes, they probably could. Would they be compliant with all of the public contract regulations? Possibly not. Uh, would they provide that full package service around? Uh, all statutory notices, construction design and management, would they take on the role of uh, principal designer and principal contractor? Would they do all of the asbestos removal? Would they do all the uh, consultation and liaison that's expected of a contractor? Again, my experience is that local building or local roofing contractors won't do all of that because they just want to come and put a new roof on. And, you know, absolutely fine. I totally agree that that's how they tend to work. Uh, but obviously, as a, a social landlord, we can't work that way. As I said, I think selection of the contractor was raised as an issue. Uh, I think that was really just leaseholders misinterpreting the Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act process uh, and procedure. There was an opportunity there to nominate during those initial stages of the process, not at stage three. Because we did it through uh, an EU and PCR compliant tender process, it was open to anyone anyway. So anyone could have tendered for those works uh, because that's the nature of public contracts. Uh, it wasn't a closed procurement exercise. It was a completely open procurement exercise. Uh, there's been questions around the need to complete works. 
I mean, you know, we, we have done surveys on the property. We also know, based on sort of experience of the properties in that area, that they're all built around the same time, all of the same construction, all of the same materials, uh, and that they are at that point where they're reaching end of life. Uh, the Sarkin felt, which sits underneath the roof tiles in most of those, has disintegrated into nothing. Uh, and I think most of the leaseholders recognise that themselves from going up into the roof space. Uh, we tend to sort of do our works on a planned basis as close to the end of life as possible to get the most out of the properties, but also recognising that what we don't want to be doing is replacing roofs as they fail on an emergency basis, because that tends to be more expensive uh, and more difficult and it will inconvenience tenants because at the point where a roof has failed and is now leaking, they're having to live with it and f feel the fe effects of it. So, you know, it's, it's that balance of trying to time it around as close as possible to end of life. There was a comment around uh, cost inflation due to delays. I think, you know, we have to recognise that when these works were originally costed, time has moved on. There is an inflationary element built into our contracts that inflate on an annual basis. Those costs have increased. And I think the view was looking at a way to uh, not pass those inflationary costs on to the leaseholders on the basis of it, the delay has been caused by the council uh, in sort of reviewing this process. And I think, that, you know, I think that's probably a fair assessment, although we need to look at the mechanics of how we do that through uh, the governance process. And then again, I think there was another comment around sort of this lack of understanding when people buy leasehold properties and the implications and liabilities of buying a leasehold property. And again, from my own experience of talking to leaseholders, I think there probably is, unfortunately, a lack of understanding with some people as to what that actually means for them and what their obligations as a leaseholder are. Uh, we need to be careful. We're not legal experts we're not off there to offer legal advice to people wanting to buy a property uh, and if we give legal advice and it's wrong we could be liable for that they employ solicitors to do that work for them solicitors ask lots of questions of us uh, and send us lots of paperwork which we fill in and return to those solicitors for them to talk to, through with their clients uh, we also have an obligation not to do or say anything that could be seen as being an attempt to discourage people from exercising their right to buy. So again, we need to be careful that what, what we're not saying anything to uh, prospective leaseholders that would put them off buying the property. We have to be honest about what being a leaseholder is, but that's for their solicitor then to explain to them. Uh, should also be recognised, of course, that an awful lot of properties that are sold aren't sold by us they're sold by you know previous owners and onward sales so we have no real knowledge of those until that paperwork comes through to us from uh, the solicitors so in those it would be near impossible to give them pre-advice because we wouldn't know about it until that point in time uh, I mean I think it's, it, it is worth pointing out that uh, a group of leaseholders did come together in Litchfield, uh, Litchfield Street area to take a case through the first tier tribunal and effectively the tribunal uh, awarded that they had to pay the costs that were being invoiced for, to them. We'd actually done the works on those and the invoices had gone out uh, and they were challenging post invoice and like I say the, the tribunal said no you've got to pay so it, the, the process we feel is being tested through that through the tribunal and we're sort of as comfortable as we can be that the process and the pricing mechanism is compliant with the common old and leasehold reform act uh, i mean i suppose in terms of options you know we continue as planned uh, recover costs in full as uh, set out in the lease our view is that that's compliant with the terms of the lease uh, Based on previous tribunal and legal advice, it would be legally compliant uh, and it would be by, uh, compliant with the procurement exercise. We could look at procuring the roofing work separately uh, and repeat that sort of consultation process. Would it achieve anything different? I don't know. Uh, it would still have to be public contract com uh, regulations compliant. Obviously, we're not in the EU now, so it doesn't need to uh, comply with the EU regulation, but essentially, I think the EU regulation is largely reflected what our public contract uh, procurement was anyway. It would require additional resource to do that uh, because previously when we tendered we had sort of external legal support and surveying support. 
that would effectively have to either be met through the housing revenue account or recharge back to leaseholders as an on cost to that project. So that there's an additional cost there. We could postpone any works until components fail, at which point we would have to do the work anyway, likely to be an increased cost and obviously inconvenience in people. Uh, there is an option there to limit cost recovery from leaseholders. Uh, I don't know how we'd do that in line with our governance requirements, and I suspect there'd be uh, questions to answer in terms of the uh, housing regulator, uh, particularly around sort of uh, tenants, uh, because effectively anything that the leaseholders aren't paying, tenants are paying and that comes straight out of the housing revenue account which means that tenants effectively would get less work done in tenanted properties because that money's been spent elsewhere. There are implications that around uh, the regulator for social housing and whether that would fall foul of any sort of uh, financial governance that they expect to see as a, from us as a local authority. There would also be the implication of it would require full consultation with our tenants consultative group uh, and I can't see why they would really support uh, subsidising leaseholders through the housing revenue account but I mean that, that's something that could be taken to them and get their view on it. Uh, you know I think in terms of equalities you know it, it is recognised that a lot of leaseholders are probably you know elderly people on low fixed incomes. Uh, unfortunately, they have a lease, they bought a leasehold property, and that lease in, in, you know, includes various covenants that you know, place obligations on them. Our revenues team will work with people so far as they possibly can on affordability and payments. Uh, you know, they tend to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis because, again, quite clearly, we know that an awful lot of uh, our properties are actually buy-to-lets. So, you know, people have bought them and they don't live in them, they actually operate them as a buy-to-let property. And there becomes that issue of affordability, can't pays, won't pays. Uh, so, you know, they, they will work with people on that. But again, there's only so much they can do uh, in, in terms of sort of how, how you sort of how you can structure payment plans for people that are affordable. Uh, so I think you know there are some decisions to be made. I don't think the only recommendation I you know I think we can make as officers is that we should proceed in line with the terms of the lease because I don't think I could make any other recommendation. Uh, but clearly, you know, if there are recommendations from the committee to cabinet to for something different, cabinet, then that's so. So, but that I don't think that's for us as officers to make those recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Just before I fetch you in, Sam, I'm just going to abuse very quickly my position as chairman. I read from you the minutes of the 7th of April Cabinet meeting, where I took, as Vice Chair of the Committee last year, seven recommendations to Cabinet. Resolved was the following, if I can just ask Mr Weston and Mr Barnes. Resolved by Cabinet, they agreed for a one-off look for this piece of work with an independent, independent assessor to assess if the costs are correct. Has that been completed? Not an independent because that's what Cabinet agreed to, an independent assessor. Okay, part that one. Number two, agreed that the portfolio holder would consider the implications of assessing all repairs in advance of leaseholders being asked to contribute and bring a report back to the next available Cabinet meeting. Well, I've looked at the 27th of April and the 8th of June, so it skipped two. So that's two recommendations we failed to uphold straight away from Cabinet. Item three. Cabinet agreed to review the council's communications when residents buy a council house, including what responsibility the obligations are the owner occupier. I think we've covered that in your introduction. Uh, review communications and include the information from the whole capital programme in the communications. Has that now been included? Number four. Review communications and include the information from for the whole capital programme in the communications. We only, we only communicate piece of work because so that's, the sorry not having a go at you Paul but that's yeah. three or four we haven't done yet that cabinet's instructed number five refer back to corporate scrutiny that the committee look at the process of requesting at least two face-to-face -face drop-ins with residents before any works commences are we now put a process in place now that says how we will work those drop-ins we haven't put that in place
Apologies, Mr. West, then I don't want you to think I'm having a go at you. You know I respect you. We've worked together for a long, long time. This entire lease over roofs issue, I find myself over time becoming more and more ashamed to be a Tamworth Borough Council on this issue. How can we not get this right? We've, we've heard tonight that you know we cannot just decide as a council if we're going to get the tenants to support the leaseholders. Actually, there's two precedents that say we can. In 2017, I gave a direct instruction as leader of this council to say when two lifts broke at the same time in one of the high-rise flats, that the leaseholders were only charged for one because that obviously was a bad maintenance of two lifts. And it never even rocked any boats. We just did it. There is precedent to say we can do this. I, I'm actually really getting to the point now where I'm actually going to move a recommendation now because we went to Cabinet and what appalled the leaseholders was as two Cabinet members left the room this, that evening, including the portfolio at the time, were overheard saying in front of the leaseholders, well, that got that out of the way. We're not going to change anything. The complaints I got the following day from the leaseholders. We tried the Cabinet route. I'd now actually like to remove to this committee that this entire issue now goes to full council for a full council debate. And we actually ask where our humanity sits on this. We've had the legal position, which is obviously Paul's responsibility, and I thank him for that. He's quite correct. It could be argued legally the council's followed the steps set out by government. But we forgot to put the humanity into it. In April 2022, Cabinet took the vulnerability pledge, the voluntary sector vulnerability pledge that says we will put vulnerable at the heart of our thinking. There is no thought for vulnerable people in this process. We have to remember, and it's a horrible thing to say, and I'll apologise to anybody that wants to raise it with me, we've got to stop thinking leaseholders have money. You don't buy a former council house if you've got a fundamental amount of money. That is a reality of life, and we keep forgetting that because we keep following a legal process. Well, that's great, and we've got to follow it, but let's put some humanity into it as well. And I think through this entire time with this issue, we continually fail to see the human, human side of this. This has dragged on for over four years with these leaseholders. COVID got in the way to a degree, yes. As information has changed, as things have been updated, and they've had hanging over them the figures of £36,000 for a roof. I don't even actually think in some cases they need, as has rightly been pointed out. Sometimes we will take a decision as a council that actually, let's fix it now rather than keep repairing it over time. But that poor leaseholder, who you might be 85 years old, hasn't got the money to fix it now. We forget the human element of it. I think it's time to get this into full council, have a proper debate about it. So I'd like to move a recommendation from this committee. This is now sent to full council for a full debate. And actually, let's get to what this and make a decision as 30 councillors on how we're going to treat these very vulnerable residents. Happy to move. So happy to second, Councillor Claymore. All those in favour? Any opposed? That is carried. That doesn't stop the scrutiny of this this evening. I just wanted to get that in. I think I've made my feelings quite clear. If you think I've been over the top, Mr. Barnes and Mr. Weston, I'm happy to apologise. As you can probably tell, I'm quite passionate about this. This has dragged on too long now. I open to the floor. Councillor Doyle, did you want to jump in? Yeah, um, just the problem I've got with this report is that it states that it's legal, uh, at least old service charges, yet the only figures in it are the page numbers. When it does go to full council, it would be good to have some details of costs because you make statements like failure to recover the costs from leaseholders would be uh, uh, having a significant impact on the financial vi viability of the 30-year HRA business plan. But there's no figures to support it. It's you could do um, as. Uh, Yeah, as Councillor Price alluded to, it's what you call it, the more information, the better. And it's, I am actually a data analyst in my day job. I see a lot of words, but nothing to support them. And if we take this to full council as well, I would expect that information to be in there. I mean, my colleagues here are new to the council as well, so this is a new issue for them. So an understanding of how much we're talking about, especially the responsibility uh, being levied on the residents and that. We really need to understand that. And I'll be honest, I wasn't sure whether I was missing something. And uh, there was a previous uh, report that supports this uh, because there's no list of background papers. If there is, could that be uh, updated and put in, please? Uh, that's me. I apologise, Sam. Did you want to jump in? Sorry. Yeah, it's just um, just to say it's, it's obviously a very emotional issue. This, and um, 
I think it's I think it's really important that all areas are are explored. Um, there does need to be humanity in it, like you said, um, and it's important that the leaseholders are all heard. And there has been a journey with this. Um, and and I want to you know I want to hear what everyone has to say on this. Um, the issue is the pragmatic issue is with not proceeding with the works as such. And I'm just presenting this side, okay? Um, is the effects it's going to have on the housing revenue account? Um, it's the potential preventing the sale of properties for those that want to sell their properties essentially and are being held back by this. Um, and also the delay increasing the costs on leaseholders and or tenants. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. I think it's important that this is heavily scrutinized. It's important it is debated, but I just wanted to put those um, those scenarios whereby if we don't sort of get on top of this and proceed further in some capacity, those could be the outcomes. Yeah, thanks for chipping that in, Sam. Absolute statements of fact. However, if somebody has twice sat in a pub with 50 plus leaseholders talking about his ruse, I'll guarantee you what they'll tell you right now. Keep fighting. We're not paying now. That, that is what they want. They're not worried about house sales. They're not worried about escalating costs. They want the council now to actually sort this out for them in the right way. Uh, Councillor Claymore. You've slightly touched on what I was going to, to come back on. And thank you for putting those points out, Councillor Smith. Um, but are we aware of any of those residents who potentially do want to sell at the moment? I wouldn't have that information on me right now, but I can look into it and get back to you. Would the officers have that information? I'm, I'm aware of one uh, that has come to us that was basically said they were looking to sell, but their surveyor, because the roof has been identified as needing renewal, uh, they were struggling to sell. So I'm only aware of one myself, but I don't have hands on with that project. Uh, Castle Coates. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just talk about human side. Um, I deal with these residents and I understand business and that, but when you've got a resident, elderly resident saying they've lost two stones to the stress of the last four years, I've got another one, 95 cent, by the time this is sorted, he'll be dead. You know, these sort of things hit home and I understand you've got business and everything, but also what I want to say is you have these meetings with the leaseholders. Um, obviously, you gave this tender out to a company. Um, I assume this company has a roofing department and a department manager. I'd like them to attend the meeting so they can explain the difference between local quotes and like you say, there's some elements and things, what the difference of 26,000 pounds actually is, you know, of these quotes um, and explain to the residents why, because maybe that's what it is. You know, if you can justify the 26,000, fair play to you. But to be perfectly honest with you, I'm, I'm seeing these residents daily. And when you're seeing someone lose two stone through the stress if they can afford a roof, no, we've got to do better as people and councillors and as a council, you know. And like I say, if weights was the right thing, I'd love to meet the roofing director at the next meeting that would be with the residents, please. Uh, we'll take that away and see what we can do. But I think there might be some commercial issues we'll have to cross first. But obviously, we'll make the request. Uh, I've got waiting. Sorry, Dan. Cheers, Chair. Um, <clears throat> Was this put on hold before the decision had come back from the Litchfield, Tri the Litchfield Tri Tribunal? Or, or, or was this put on hold while that was going through? The Litchfield Tribunal happened before this, so we'd already had that uh, return on that from the Tribunal. And I think it was actually raised at the committee meeting where this was referred previously. So I think we'd said, you know, we were comfortable with the legal side of it being correct because we've gone through that uh, tribunal process. James, uh, I mean, I can understand what the chair is saying and, and um, representations that, that, that have just been heard about the humani humanity side of it, but my difficulty with this is that a contract's been signed. It was up to their solicitor to tell them the implications of such a contract. Now, 
the chair said that people who buy count, former council houses don't have money, or probably won't have money. But we're going to have to suggestively raid the HRA account. People who live in HRA properties generally don't have a great deal of money, so we're going to have to raid their piggy bank to sort somebody else's out. To me, that doesn't seem fair on to one side or the other. And further than that, not all pensioners, and I, 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 I heard about the, 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 the two that you've just mentioned with the weight loss, but all pensioners aren't lacking money. So, some will have money, some won't. Some will be able to fund it, some won't. So then we're, we're, we're picking and choosing there when when there's been a, a legal binding contract signed and that that's that's what I'm struggling with and like I say I've, I've heard I've heard what what's been said and it it, it, is, it is painful of own a couple of properties I have to go through these contracts if, if I've got a lease sold if, if I was to not pay my contracts I'd, I'd lose lose the property um, so yeah that's that's what I'm struggling with but yeah none of the properties are in the borough by the way so no need for declarations of interest, sir. To take your points on board, then, just to clarify, at no point have I said the council should pay for this. I think we should have a proper debate about what has actually happened and what we think we should do going forward. I would probably support some sort of contribution. I'm not saying do it all. And I think if you ask a lot of the leases holders up there, and I'm sure Councillor Coates would agree, some of them will happily pay when somebody actually sits in front of them and justifies how we got to these figures and why it's taken four years of torture. If you'd asked me in 2019, I would leave the council at the time, sorry. If you asked me in 2019, should we fund these roofs? I'd have said no. If you'd asked me in 2020, should we fund these roofs? I'd have said no. If you'd asked me in 2021, should we fund these roofs? I'd have said no. If you'd asked me three years into it, four years into it, should we now start thinking of funding some of these roofs for the pain we've put these people through? My opinion is vastly changing very quickly. That's why we're here. Well, when Scrutiny looked at this back in February, you know, a lot of people started exactly where you are at the start of the debate, and then we started to see the correspondence and the unfolding of residents' opinions and what had been going on and everything that how this is dragged out for years. And a lot of opinions shifted right to where mine is tonight. I remember Councillor Goodall at the time being very where you are. After two subgroup meetings, he was very where I am. And I think, obviously, you're very new to the issue. It's not your patch. You're on exactly the other side of town. And obviously, you weren't on COVID last year. So, I don't think you've seen the information, maybe some of the rest of us, and that's why I want 30 councillors to sit and look at this. I think there's a lot of learning this council can take from this. So, Paul, can I just quickly clarify, the Litchfield Road issue, was that the one in 2007 uh, when Stan Turner took us to court? Oh, just, just checking. No, it's more recent, under the contract. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bain. Yeah, we did, uh, we did talk about this issue, didn't we? Um, and I think the, the point that we made there was that um, communication is at the heart of this and ensuring that the people that you're communicating with have a genuine understanding of what it is they're taking on. And we asked, did we not, to see um, copies of the letters that were sent to them to see if they were in English. Uh, we've all been in meetings with lawyers where they, after they finished explaining to us, we understood less than we did at the beginning. And I think that's, that's in the nature of, of lawyers. So I think what's needed is plain English communication with people who are thinking of taking leases on. And in terms of, of Dan Maycock's point about um, older people having um, some income, actually what we tend to find is that older people are capital rich and revenue poor. And actually it's the sustaining of properties that keeps them revenue poor. And if they try to run a car as well, they're revenue poor. So I don't think there is a huge amount of money out there with leaseholders. And I, I find myself incredibly agreeing with Danny Cook that uh, this needs the humanity putting into it. it. I understand the legal process, but for the people living there, that is not a legal process. It's their home. It's their life. It's their quality of life. And I think that can get lost in legal process. So I'd like to hear more about the communications I'd like to have a greater understanding about the gra backgrounds of the people who are involved in all of this to see whether they have any ability at all to make a contribution. Thank you, Councillor Bain. Any further questions or comments? Oh, sorry, Mr Barnes. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I won't try to cover everything that's come up tonight. I suppose it, just a couple of things from me. What, one is just to clarify 
Um, so, you, you know, thank you for drawing our attention back to those cabinet recommendations. Um, clearly, there, there, there are a couple of recommendations there that we need to pick up, we need to, to particularly about reporting back to cabinet um, on those specific issues. I think what we can say, and just for your reassurance, that each one of those, we, we did, we have looked at those recommendations and information was provided um, d around what the implications of that is, uh, what was back to the portfolio holder in terms of, um, you know, the implications of that, the risks and what was, was doable and what was, wasn't doable. Um, in terms of, just to clarify a couple of points, I mean, in terms of the impact on the HRA, um, no, there isn't any information in there because I guess we would need to be understanding what we were actually sort of referring to. Um, so the implication on the HRA clearly of not doing, not charging for these particular works to these rules, to these uh, rules, would be different from saying actually the council is taking a policy standpoint to never charge leaseholders for for works. And I think that's the discussion that we we would need to be having because it's I think in, in making exceptions. Uh, on a regular basis in relation to particular works or particular groups of leaseholders, we will always be back in this discussion and this debate. So I think the, the, the issue here is about um, thinking about what the Council's overall policy position w is in terms of charging leaseholders or indeed any other resident um, where there's a clear contractual requirement for that resident to actually make a contribution towards the cost of works or any other. Um, uh, any, anything else that the council is doing for them. I think in terms of if we take that um, point and we actually look at the HRA business plan and the financing of, of um, the council's ongoing investment in its council stock, if we were to say, well, no, we don't charge leaseholders for works, their properties, then the implications of the HRA are devastating. And I think that, you know, that's, we're not sort of sitting here saying, it's important to charge people because, um, you know, simply on the basis because we want to do that. There is also a new regulatory framework which has come come into uh, is coming into force, which requires us to um, it reinforces the ring fencing between the HRA and the general fund, and also requires us for any major decision in relation to um, HRA activities to be uh, consulting fully with tenants. So again, that, that issue about consultation with tenants and taking this issue back to tenants in some form um, is, is, is paramount and something we would need to do or we, we would be um, knowingly um, ignoring that requirement that, that you know, is placed on us um, through regulation. Um, in terms of then of the, of the communication issues, of course, any customer feedback and any way we can improve our processes or our communication, then that's something we're, we're fully on board with and would, um, you know, and, and would be um, very happy to review our communication on that. I think, as Paul has said, there is a difficulty in terms of this issue of us providing information to leaseholders that kind of gives them every uh, all all the information about. Uh, you know their liabilities going forward. That is a role of their solicitor, and there is only so much that we can do um, on that um, before we start to sort of uh, drift into territory, which actually could be difficult for us. Um, but I think the the uh, probably the thing that we can take away here. Obviously, you, you've got your um, recommendation. I think we will sort of go back to those cabinet recommendations and ensure that we have fed back in the correct way on, on each one of those in terms of. Um, what our response to that is, what action has been undertaken, um, what, what actually, um, you know, what are the risks and what are the, what's allowable for us legally. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I don't think anybody's saying that there shouldn't be a contribution. I think my concern is about full cost recovery, because I think that is what places the burden on people. Uh, and, and what happens if the leaseholder can't pay? simply doesn't have the money what happens to that roof they lose the property so there's a charge put on the property i actually suspect there's a few of the flats in the high rise where the council now re-owns it because it's been done that often right well i mean that i have to say i have concerned about charge being put against property Um, so, no, the, the thing the residents were saying, I mean, they've been told that they need a whole new roof. Um, obviously, 
that's the main concern. And obviously you're saying it's what repairs need doing. Well, why have they already been told that they need a whole new roof? And also, speaking of the leaseholder side, it actually says in there, keeping in repairs of the block. It doesn't actually say full replacement. So, you know, it, why why aren't we just doing the jobs that need doing instead of just ripping the whole roof off and starting again? I mean, I think, yeah, we've had surveys done on them. We have shared that with the group that was set up by Scrutiny. Uh, there comes a point where you have to replace components because they've, they've reached the end of their serviceable life. That's that's a fact. I mean, you know, we've probably, on a lot of our assets, we've probably sweated them further than we probably should. I mean, there's, there's some of the properties, you know, realistically a roof, 60 years for a, a roof. I suspect some of them have probably gone over that because we, we push them as far as we can. But there comes a point where you have to renew because effectively you're doing so much in the way of repair you are renewing it. Uh, so, you know, I think when it says keeping repair, what it's talking about is making sure those components in that property are fit for purpose that they were designed for. There comes a point where the only way to do that is to replace, to retain the life of the building. Uh, you, could, you could spend probably several thousand pounds a year putting scaffolding up, repairing a roof, taking the scaffolding back down, and then going back and repairing it and taking the scaffolding down to the point where actually over probably the course of 12 months, two years, you've, you've almost covered the cost of replacing the roof anyway. So, that, you know, it's that you have to look at, at some point, replacement is the right answer. Okay, thank you. All I'll say on that is that surely if you did it that way, the person would be able to afford that because they're spending the money over a period of time, not in one lump sum. Councillor Maker. I, I think I heard it, but I just, just wanted to double check that, that, that can there be, you're not asking for an up lump sum payment, are you? It, it can be negotiated for payments. The terms of the lease set out the mechanism payment, and it would be an invoice payable within X number of days. However, our finance team will talk to individuals and assess their financial uh, capacity to pay and come up with a payment plan for them. I don't get involved in that side of it, it's our finance team do, but they will talk to individuals and do that because like I said, they'll make that assessment with them and work with them to try and sort of work out the best arrangement. Councillor Doyle. Just a quick query of what you said with the finance team. I take it we wouldn't be charging them any form of interest on that. No, I mean, essentially what they do is, you know, they, they will look at sort of splitting down that payment to make it as affordable as possible within reason. Uh, you know, I suppose if someone said they could only afford to pay 50 pence a year for the next thousand years or something, clearly not, not viable. So they have to look at what's a, a reasonable assessment, but there wouldn't, but there wouldn't be any extra charges for doing that. You know, any further questions or comments? You know? Thank you very much, at which point I'll take us to item 11. Uh, I'm happy to invite the officers if they wish to uh, get themselves off home and uh, same with the leader and the portfolio holder if they wish. Oh, you're more than welcome to stay either way. Uh, yeah, take us to item 11, working group update. I don't think we really have any updates as this no. is the first meeting of the year. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is a standing item on the agenda, so it's there. So yeah, I'll happily take us to item 12, forward plan. Uh, does anybody have any issues or Anything on the forward plan that they wish to potentially fetch to scrutiny, ask any questions about? I'd look earlier. I didn't see anything specific. Go on, Councillor Bain. Yeah, we might have more questions after the debate next Monday, so perhaps it could come back. Do you know what you stole my thunder again? It's exactly what I was going to say. I think where we get after the full council and we've debated is the vision and corporate priorities correct. We'll set out actually what should scrutiny be looking at. Absolutely correct. <laughs> okay. Do you want to park this item for now? And we can actually talk offline. And if anybody wants to get anything on an agenda, happy to make it happen. Obviously, as long as the information is available. Okay, that's brilliant. And obviously, Corporate Scrutiny Committee work plan and action log. 
Sorry. Well, there we go. Very out of date. So what was left over from last year? Uh, bu -bu -bu -bum. Obviously, Solwell Trading Company was covered. We've had repairs contract this evening. Lease all the lease charges this evening. Quarter four performance this evening. Other than that, I don't see anything that's been vastly left over from last year. So obviously, um, as, I, as I look to prepare agenda as far as this evening, we can try and set one out now, or we can remain a little bit fluid as issues come up, or members spot things, because some of us are new, uh, that really need looking into. So I'm happy to remain a little bit fluid for now. We'll set out for the agenda for this, one second, Council Door, sorry. We'll set out the agenda for the next meeting to be obviously about housing repairs, and we'll set out obviously what I'm doing, but we'll leave the agenda open for a few days if anybody's got anything they want to throw at it. Councillor Doyle. Just a quick one. Um, how far off is the scrutiny training? Yeah, I, I, actually, I should have looked at my calendar, shouldn't I? But I think once we've gone through the training, it might um, create some discussion. Councillor Maycock. Uh, <clears throat> have the scrutiny chairs met up yet? Not yet, but we will be doing. 